move to the president's report. Commissioners, in August, you authorized uh, $25 million worth of bonds in the water division. We have sold those bonds, and I recognize Chris Hood, our manager of accounting, to update you on that sale. Thank you, Mr. Roach. Uh, I do want to provide an update to you today on our recent sale of water bonds. Uh, if you will recall, in August, the board uh, authorized additional debt financing in the water division uh, to partially fund the Century 2 campaign. In October, the issue was taken to City Council and they approved the issue of this additional debt. Uh, the bonds were competitively bid on November 9th. On November 9th. Uh, can you be receiving seven bids from underwriters on the debt? Uh, the low bid on the debt was from UBS Financial Services and it came in at a true interest cost of 3.819%. Uh, the maturity on this debt, as you recall, for Century 2 uh, was lengthened uh, by the board. And these, these bonds are set to mature between 2013 and 2040. Uh, the ratings agencies deem this to be high quality debt, as you can see by the ratings to both S&P and Moody's. And uh, ultimately, on uh, December 1st, the sale was closed and KB received the bond proceeds. Where does this bring our total water debt profile to? Uh, you can see here we currently have $108 million outstanding in, in the water division uh, through bonds. Uh, associated with that is $65 million in interest cost. Uh, the chart on the right here depicts uh, our debt payoff schedule. Uh, the green is the existing bonds, uh, the blue representing the new debt issue. Uh, you can also see here in the latter years uh, where we took this issue out to a longer maturity uh, the bars on the end of the debt horizon show that new uh, debt issue there. Uh, in terms of our debt management policy, uh, you can see here that we have, uh, within the next 10 years, got 31.4% of our principal paid down on our total debt. Debt policy states in the water division that we've got to pay 30%, so we are above that limit. Uh, in addition, this debt issue took our debt percentage to 42.6%, well below the minimum for the water division, which is 60%. Uh, in addition, our total debt portfolio in the water division carries a 4.06 interest rate. Who bid on our bonds? Okay, as I mentioned, UBS Financial of the seven underwriters, they had the lowest bid at 3.819%. Uh, if you go to the second bidder there, Baird, uh, the difference between those two bids represents about $250,000 over the life of the bonds in interest cost. Uh, final bidder there, U.S. Bank Corp. bid 4.243%. Uh, the spread between the top bidder and the low bidder was roughly $2.3 million. And of these, uh, I think four of these underwriters have, have taken our debt previously, so we, we did get a good uh, uh, portfolio of bidders on this, on this debt. Finally, what did it cost us to issue the debt? Uh, in total, uh, $118,000 that breaks out, uh, or excuse me, $40,000 to Morgan Keegan, who acts as our financial advisor on the debt. Massbury Sims was our legal counsel on the bonds. Uh, we compensated them to rate $30,000. Ratings agencies combined for $36,000. And Regions acting as the pay agent uh, was compensated $750. Additional miscellaneous costs associated with the issue, $11,000 for printing, advertising, etc. Uh, in total, the total issue cost of the bond was less than one half of one percent of the $25 million bond offer.
include something that's higher than we want right now. That is correct. That 4.06, when we come back to the board after we do the refunding, it may be actually south of the percent. <coughs> well, with the interest rate savings that you, that you benchmark, it's not worth it unless it's so many percentage points. On a refunding, we um, state that we want to have 3% net present value of the refunded principal. <clears throat> you put form on that. What, what rate did you plug in on that? I believe, Commissioner, it was 4.25. So the comment Chris made about the, the interest rate spread between the 3.819 and the very highest bid, really that's what we budgeted was based upon what turned out to be the highest bid. So that two million plus savings is what we'll realize over the long term in our financial plan. Now that's many years, but it's about one to two hundred thousand dollars a year, something such as that, maybe a little bit less. Just one more time on that rate on that chart. The, the blue new issue, meaning roughly we're going to have new issues of ten to twenty million dollars every so many years. It's really going to replace what's being retired. The, the debt profile, the amount of debt outstanding will increase over time. We will not retire enough to cancel out the new issues, especially over, as now we've begun seeing through two. The next water bond issue is $25 million also. It's fall of 2013. So the, the amount of debt outstanding will continue to grow over time. Mark, I, I, I'm confused. I, well, again, I'm confused. But, um, <coughs> I actually meant on the, when the refunding of the room <coughs> oh, the yeah, last, what was your program on that? I mean, is that as an indicator of what we might be able to sell the, new, the, re, the refinance bonds? So that's what I was interested in. The refinance bonds, um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, commissioners, but for water, we're looking at a savings of probably 70 to 80 basis points. I believe the average cost on the debt that's being refunded is 4.5%, I want to say, and what it will be, what it will be replaced at is around 3.5. Um, so I think there was a 70 to 80 basis point spread, from what I recall, in the old debt and the debt that will replace it on the upcoming refund. Does that answer you? Well, it, but at 3.5, and we just paid 3.8, so are we, are we the maturity schedule is different. The maturity schedule on the, what I'm thinking is the 3.5, 3.4 to 3.5, only goes out to 2029. This goes out to 2040, and there's your difference. The longer that you're going to go with the maturities, you're going to have a little bit higher risk premium for the bondholders associated with that. So the rate's going to be higher. Well, based on on what just occurred, would you expect that your 3.5 or 3.4 number to go down? I, it could. Um, by the time we sell those bonds by late January, I don't think we're going to see a tremendous amount. Of <coughs> I think what we pay for refunding at right now will be very close. Now, obviously, market conditions, something could change. That, that I don't think it'll go much lower. It might. Spread might be lessened a little bit. I think that's where the, the exposure is probably. Other questions? Chris, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> and we have another presence report. I'll recognize Mike Patterson, who's our manager of system operations. And as a little bit of an intro, uh, you know that about five or six years ago, the board created a metric on reliability. We think it's really important to keep people in power. And there are many factors that affect that, and one is vegetation management. You've heard an awful lot about that. I want to share with you that, that Mike will not get into a lot of detail about that today because at the January board meeting, we will have a report out of the first 12 months of implementation of the Tree Trend Policy Review Panel's recommendations. So we're going to save the bulk of the information about vegetation management 
and the efforts there until January, but Mike's really going to focus today on the other efforts that we have that are attempting to improve the liability on our system. Mike? Thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioners. As Ms. Rose mentioned, uh, I want to talk to you about the liability. And just to go back in a little bit of time, back in 2005, KUB's reliability was about two and a half times the national average. Uh, the electrical industry measures reliability in customer minutes of interruption, or CMI. And at that time, KUB began tracking our reliability. We recognized that we did need to improve. And at that time, the Board Audit Committee did set a five-year goal for KUB to, to show improvement to get down to the national average in a five-year period. So this morning, I want to talk to you a little bit about how we've achieved that goal, uh, how we're able to come about that and where we're going in the future to make sure that we continue to improve our reliability. On every outage event that KUB responds to, our responders track and document what caused that outage to occur. And when they close out the job, our computer system captures that data and as we go back and analyze that data, we group it into large buckets of, of information. And what you see here is a graph showing some of those major causes, acts of man, equipment failure, and so forth. Uh, you're drawn to the, the large graph on the left, the acts of nature, and specifically the dark blue part of that graph. It shows that 80% of every outage that we experience on the KUB system is due to vegetation uh, that either grows into our system or trees that might fall into our system and cause damage. So as we mentioned, we're going to talk more about that in January when Liz Hanna comes to give you some details about the successes of our vegetation program. But because we know that vegetation is the leading cause of outages on the KUB system, we do spend a lot of effort on that program. Uh, and it has uh, served our customers very well. But we also do a lot of other things to make sure that we keep those customer minutes of interruption as low as possible. And one of the uh, most low cost, most effective things that we do is through our storm planning. Whenever there's a weather forecast that calls for a condition that we might have outages, uh, our storm planning team at KUB uh, assembles and we start making preparations for that storm event. Sometimes we may have days of advance notice as we did back in April when the National Weather Service forecasted the strong front coming through that affected uh, Alabama and the whole southeast. Other times we may only have a few hours. But regardless, that group would get together, we'll talk about resources needed to respond to an event, make sure we have the right personnel uh, available as well as equipment uh, to respond to any outage. We've also done a lot with our computer systems at KUB. We have a very sophisticated GIS product, a graphic information, graphical information system that, that captures a lot of data uh, on the KUB electric system. We can use that system model then to go out and predict where might we have trouble in the future if we had equipment failure or if we lost a major line due to a, a storm event. And through that uh, computer modeling, we can run some scenarios to make sure that we head off those problems. Uh, a perfect example of that would be the work that we did uh, several years ago to model our system in the Seymour area uh, in South Knoxville and in Sevier County. Uh, we foresaw the that that community was growing, that the demand was increasing. So when we put the, our equipment and wires into that model, we knew we had to make some improvements in that area to, to beef up and harden our system. You've heard us talk on a couple of occasions about our outage management system. Uh, again, that is a, a computer system that we use at KUB once we're in storm mode, and certainly on, on a day like today, if there's an individual customer outage and how we receive that order into our system, how we effectively manage that work until it's concluded and, and power is restored. Uh, that outage management system has been a, a tremendous help to us and working very efficiently through all storm events. And certainly just KUB's overall storm response. Uh, through, through our storm planning, through using the OMS, through, through getting our construction crews on board, assigning different storm roles for various folks throughout KUB, we are able to, to very quickly uh, uh, go to a storm event and, and start restoring power to, again, reduce those customer minutes of interruption. 
and we, we've used a lot of technologies throughout the system to help us be as efficient as we are, and we recognize that there's a use for expanded use of technologies. Uh, some of the things that, that we've spoken about in the past, just to, to go back and review a little, are some of our faulted circuit indicators and some of our smart switches that we use. These are devices that, are, that we have installed out in the system to help our responders identify and locate where the problems are so they can not spend as much time looking for the problem, but spend more time making repairs. Uh, we've talked about our automated uh, distribution system, the health self-healing system. Uh, we've put some of that equipment out in the field and it's shown to work uh, very well for us as well. Right now we're putting a lot of our effort into the smart grid area, uh, this in the Fort Sanders area uh, to put in some new systems to, so we can evaluate those to see their effectiveness to see if we want to use those throughout the entire KUB system eventually. Excuse me, eventually. And then also we have our uh, supervisory control and data acquisition. Uh, that's a big name for a term that just lets us have a visibility in the operations center of what's going on out in our system. When the breaker operates and loses power, we can know about it. Uh, we don't have to wait for an individual call in that case if an entire breaker is going out. So again, those technologies help us recognize and respond very quickly to system events. What well, temperature system has as the, you know, the, uh, an area goes out, how much of our, and you can see it on your computer, how much of our system is covered by that? Could you go back one slide? Sure. Please? Okay, the fault of circuit indicators. Okay, is that throughout our system or is that on certain areas? I mean, how much of our system has these things that you talk about? Okay. <clears throat> Uh, my next slide that I'll show will show the extent of where we've installed that thus far. Okay. Okay. Uh, but but your question about how much, how many places do we know when the power goes out versus do we depend on customers calling in? Right. Correct. I think you maybe asked about the customer meeting that. Yes. <laughs> uh, the difference there is if it is a if it's a breaker that goes out in the substation uh -huh. through the skater, we do know about that. Right. But as those lines go out and serve our customers, we have uh, sections that line may peel off and serve this neighborhood mm -hmm. or this little commercial park. And we protect our equipment with fuses or reclosers at each of those taps. So if something happens that doesn't affect the breaker, then we may not have visibility of that. Okay. And we do need our customers to call in and start reporting mm -hmm. if we have outages. Yeah. Okay. 